So tonight I am joined by Callie Ward. Um, so I'll introduce myself first. So my name is Emily and I'm a speech and language therapist. I work for Toby Dynavox. Um, and Callie, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, so I'm a teacher. Um, I was teaching at a mainstream primary school um, and my I've worked in special needs as well and using soft tech and then my niece was diagnosed with Rett syndrome so we started using um, a lot of AAC and um, a Toby um, and now I am coaching for Rett U and working with Rett UK to set up um, some support for education and communication here in the UK. Yep, great. Um, so I guess tonight's webinar, the subject was a result of us having a conversation really around um, what is early intervention with AAC and actually for those people who are very new to AAC, yeah. where can you find that information? So what do we think to ourselves? We, we thought that we, um, as uh, the questions asked a lot on on different Facebook groups, kind of where where do I get started? What should I be doing? Um, there's a lot of parents that feel uh, alone in it and maybe can't get help. Um, so we just wanted to give you some starting points, really. Yeah. So I guess it's a real um, it's kind of a beginner's introduction to AAC, really. Somewhere we can direct people to say, actually, if you are brand new, um, and we'll go on to talk about what that feels like because I know I certainly. I've experienced that feeling and I'm yeah. sure you have too. Um, just a general place to get some of those very basic questions answered. So I'm going to start with, um, if I go back into the PowerPoint. So these um, are the ground rules that we've stolen from Hector. So yeah, they, the, the webinars are designed to be very informal. Um, so yeah, please use the chat window. Um, you should be able to see that on your go-to webinar um, little screen. Thing. Um, and just ask us anything, if there's anything that we've not covered or that you want us to go back over, just stay in that chat window and should be able to have a little oh, look. Oh, it doesn't make sense, we said in a confusing way. <laughs> yeah, it might, <laughs> like, it might be confusing, we might confuse ourselves um, or you, so please say. Um, also, yeah, there are no stupid questions. Um, I'll probably be asking a lot of the most basic questions. Um, so please feel free to ask anything you like, well not anything you like actually, <laughs> it's got to be related to early intervention with AAC generally, um, but yeah any questions you've got please just type them. Um, again if you need to revisit a particular topic after the webinar um, then yeah you will have the details for myself and for Callie so you should be able to book a one on one. Um, yeah, this is the early intervention for beginners clinic. So we've mentioned how that came up, really. Um, but do let us know what things you would like to see in the future, because I know that I certainly am always on the lookout for topics that are of interest to anybody. Um, and then this one here, allow us to switch between applications. We're keeping it nice and simple tonight. We're not going to be switching through anything. No. no. <laughs> so. Um, maybe just give me some time with the PowerPoint, but hopefully that should be okay. Right, so I have a disclaimer to make. Firstly, I am not Hector, whether you may or may not have noticed, um, I am brand new to the company, um, so I'm a very fresh face, not just to Toby Dynavox, but also to the AAC world generally. Um, I trained as a speech and language therapist and qualified in May of this year. So just all round, I'm a bit green really. Um, so I know that I certainly have been messaging everybody I can, uh, well, I can on Facebook who knows anything about AAC to help answer my questions, including including you, Kelly. She's not really giving herself quite enough credit though. You are very good at that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that one up. And, you uh, had the muddling down to a tea earlier. Yeah, 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 we had a nice session earlier where we were doing some, some modelling and... Uh, storytelling. Storytelling with AAC, so yeah, not completely green, but still, you know, kind of in that shade of the colour wheel. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, where are we starting? So, what is AAC? What is AAC? Um, I think... I don't know how you feel about this, but the acronym AAC, um, how often does it get sort of it gets bandied around? around a lot. Do we even know what the words are? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so we thought we'd start with the very basics. So AAC stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. And I guess what's that when it's at home? <laughs> Anything that's not verbal speech. Yeah, so any other ways of communicating. Yeah, so that could be, you should see there's some pictures there of all the different things that fall under this category. So um, any signing system, some of you might be familiar with things like Makaton, um, or actually even if we bring it way back, Gesture, that's a form of AAC. Um, it's something that helps us to communicate our message mm -hmm. that isn't our spoken word. Yeah. Um, you should also see to the right of that, there's a boy with a little book that's a communication book. I think that might be a textbook, actually, mm -hmm. which we'll go on to talk about later. Um, they so, have their pros and cons. <laughs> yes, they do have their pros and cons, and we, we will be talking about that. Uh, but yeah, that's a textbook, and again, that falls under the remit of AAC. Um, and then above that, we have... Is that a C-series? I think it might be. I think that is before my time, so that is, <laughs> <laughs> that is a high-tech... AAC system, you should see there, I think that is a, um, that's a keyboard, so yeah, we're talking about all the things, right from gesture all the way through to high-tech devices. So, moving on, how can AAC help? So, AAC can um, help, help you to communicate um, with your loved ones, it can help you to say what you really want to say. And I guess the question there is really, well, why would you need AAC? <laughs> I'm going a bit off topic here, but why would you need AAC? If, if you can't speak verbally, um, you, you don't have that form of communication, um, but you still, you still have a lot of things that you want to be able to say, um, and you want, you want to be able to say exactly what you want to say, not kind of the things you've been directed to say. I know we kind of just mentioned about pecs before, and I know we're going to talk about them further along the line, but you don't want to be able to just say, I want the toilet, or I want some food. You want to be able to have a conversation like anyone else could, um, with your family, with your friends. Um, this yeah. quote it was from Communication Matters. We really like to, our wants and needs the primary reason for communication. If you could say one thing, what would it be? I want the toilet or I love you. So the purpose of AAC is to give someone a voice. Yeah, and um, I guess there are lots of different reasons why. So I was thinking on the lines of you might be thinking um, about children, or not just children actually, anybody with um, severe physical disabilities, which means actually it's the, the speech that's a, a difficulty. Um, but also language difficulties, because the two are different. So um, there are lots of reasons why you might need AAC. Um, and I suppose along the lines of what you were saying about having a full communication system in place, um, that can help to reduce frustration yeah. um, by being able to say what you want. I had a mini breakdown earlier talking about... Um, some of the things that I'm doing at the moment, <laughs> just the amount of things I've got going on. But no, but in seriousness, um, yeah, if you can tell someone. Yeah, these are the things that are frustrating me at the moment. Um, enabling interaction, so creating that shared communication space. Um, again, what's that when it's at home? We talk about this all the time, shared communication space. What does that actually mean? I don't know, you tell me. Well, I can tell you what I think about it. Um, shared communication space. So something that enables the two people to actually have an interaction. So um, that might be um, a game, for instance, that allows two people to talk back and forth. It might be um, a book that allows you to have a conversation about something that you have um, a shared knowledge about. Um, it might be being able to shout at someone because they've annoyed you. Maybe. You know, being able, yeah. to express, <laughs> being able to express yourself. Yeah. Um, in whatever form that is. Um, it also can help to facilitate literacy development. So I guess I'll talk, wait, I'll let you talk about that being the teacher <laughs> in the, uh, the conversation here. So we can use kind of AAC and develop AAC um, to, a gra to gradually go on to be able to read and write. And Really, the purpose of that is if you can read and you can write, you'll be able to say whatever you want to say. Um, so we can use um, altern um, kind of alternative methods so that um, the 
kids can be scribbling, which will eventually turn into writing and can do that using um, ABC, whether that's through kind of eye gaze or through pointing at letters. But um, just kind of, we just wanted to mention really that um, how important it is to um, give AAC users this exposure to um, literacy, to letters, and to not have the expectation they're going to be writing in full sentences, because especially the little ones, if they've not been taught first, who, who can write in full sentences straight away, but allowing them that opportunity to scribble that those can, who can pick up a pencil um, are allowed to do, um, and then eventually that, that being able to kind of turn into being able to type and say exactly what you want to say. Yeah, yeah, I think you said that very well. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, you did. Um, and then that last point, I suppose, not just about wants and needs. We've spoken about that and how um, communication is, is so much more than just our wants and needs. Um, and that quote that we highlighted, I think, really demonstrates that. So, so does this. Our other so, quote. <laughs> oh, this is a quote that we love. Um, I put like, actually, I love it. Um, so, where did you see this quote? Um, was it when Aaron was talking at a set? No, I think it was at Isaac. Oh, it was at Isaac. Yeah, somebody else quoted Aaron at yeah. Isaac. So, Callie yeah. was at Isaac this year. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, this was a quote that you heard. So, communication is when one person shares something the other person did not know that they were thinking. And I think that's a really... Um, it's quite a poignant quote as mm -hmm. I think if we think about wants and needs and how often that's put into communication and uh, intervention programs I say that with inverted commas um, about trying to make sure that people can express their wants and needs actually a lot of the time you know what someone wants and needs just from the way that they are and actually true communication and that communication that's so important to us mm -hmm. is when someone says something that really Kind of strikes you and you think, oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you, I didn't know that you liked um, Fine and Sam as opposed to Peppa Pig, because Fine and Sam's a little bit older, and you know, something yeah. that you've not, you wouldn't necessarily know about someone. Um, do you know what did it, what did it mean to you when you heard this quote? Um, yeah, exactly that. But I think it kind of struck me um, that we can really feed things into children, you know, when we're giving them two choices or we're kind of giving them the PEX books and we're limiting what they can say and really then we're not giving the opportunity to say exactly what we want to and I just think how frustrating that would be for me if I can say what I wanted to say because let's face it, no one can read, read minds. No. I don't think I'd want to either. Yeah. I'm also going to backtrack a little bit because we just were saying that I'm at Isaac and I feel like we've just thrown another acronym out there. Oh. So <laughs> Isaac well, is... You wouldn't um, know it was an, an acronym unless you could see it. Well, but that's what, true, yeah. What is Isaac? It's um, a conference all about AAC. So there were lots of amazing people there um, speaking about kind of all, all different forms of AAC and literacy development. Um, uh, a lot about kind of social groups, communication groups. Um, yeah, that not so. It was in Canada. I was. On a side note. I wasn't there. Emily wasn't there, but she no. wishes she was. I do wish I was, but I followed the tweets quite avidly to see what was going on. <laughs> but I wasn't actually there. Um, okay, moving on. So modelling. So I don't know how many people have heard again this word thrown around a lot and. Um, the, there will be a lot of people that are very familiar with modelling, but I think also equally there will be a lot of people who aren't entirely sure what that means in terms of AAC. And um, I know that throughout my time training, although a lot of these principles uh, to do with modelling, actually when they were explained to me was um, very clear, but it wasn't really ever explained to me what modelling with AAC was all about. So, um, yeah, what is modelling? Um, modelling really is talking in the language that you're asking the AAC users to talk in. So as you're speaking the words um, or the symbols, you're, you, you're pointing to them um, and speaking with them as well because we can't really expect somebody to learn how to use symbols and to learn what they mean unless we talk to them ourselves. It, it would be a bit like me asking you to learn French but never speaking to you in French and never teaching you a word of French but expecting you to just 
speak it. Um, without modeling, really, we can't expect a user to learn how to use their device, whatever device that is. Yeah, so, yeah, how do babies learn to talk? Why are you talking to them? Yeah, no, so, it's, it's true. Um, and babies hear language around them constantly um, from birth all the time and AAC is just like that, the mm. idea that actually... Um, I'm just, I'm going to flick a slide at the minute because I think um, this would be a good quote to share. Yeah, <laughs> so back again. the typically developing child will have been exposed to oral language for approximately 4,380 waking hours by the time he begins speaking at about 18 months. So that translates to four to 6,000 words per day for one year before they speak their first word, and four to thousand sorry, four <laughs> to six I can't read four <laughs> to six thousand words per day for the second year before they start stringing two words together, and that's a typically developing child. So if we are using a different symbol set, so if you are thinking about any of those alternative communication systems, whether that be PEX, whether that be high tech, so those sort of um, that high tech device that you saw on, on the first slides. And when, whatever software that is on there, whether it be. Yeah, whatever that is, it will take the alternate symbol user 84 years to have the same experience with his symbols that the typically developing child has with the spoken word in 18 months. If you were only putting them in therapy for 20 to 30 minutes each, um, I think that, that can be a, a big problem. A lot of people are only getting access. Um, to their therapist um, for, a sh for a short session each week and if that's the only time they're getting their AAC, well 84 years is a very long time, <laughs> um, which, which is why um, a lot of it is falling to teachers, to parents, to you know whoever, whoever is with the user um, because we all need to be modeling and we all need to be talking in that language as much as we can ideally 4,000 to 6,000 words per day for one year. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is, which is hard. To I think, give them the same exposure. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Um, that would be a lot. <laughs> I think it's, it's really important to also note that, that it is difficult. Yeah, you know, it is. Um, we talk all the time. The language is everywhere. It's all around um, young yeah. children. And for the AAC user, they, they're just not getting yeah. that same level of input. And it um, is important to be realistic and maybe maybe you're at the park and maybe you've taken your context grid with you and maybe it's just for 30 seconds you model you model a few words like, oh, the swing is going high and they're the three words you point to and I like it, three more words. Um, and even just that small exposure is helping them to build up vocabulary um, in context. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, and we've also spoken here about a range of word types and contexts, and I think um, the point that we were trying to make there is that, um, I know this has been covered on previous webinars actually, mm -hmm. about very noun-heavy systems. Yeah. And I think There's a lot to talk about nouns. <laughs> yeah, but I think the reason that that happens is because when you're thinking about the key words in a sentence, often it is those, yeah. those nouns, that's what carries a lot of the meaning. So it can be very tempting just to model those because then you think actually if I'm giving all those key words, the rest of the meaning will carry. And that isn't always the case because um, depending on what other words are in the sentence, so some of those smaller words or, or verbs will actually change the meaning. Exactly. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it is important to make sure that we are not just modeling nouns I think that goes back to the whole being able to say exactly what you want to say. Like if you can only say the nouns, people can only make guesses about what you're thinking about those nouns. Whereas if you've got the describing words as well, the like, the fun, the hate, the yeah, this is so boring, then you've got the ability to communicate the message that you want to communicate, not just to choose a noun. Yeah. Um, so let's skip forward some more. So we've spoken a lot about modelling, but how do you model? Um, and I think for me, the easiest way to think about this is um, to think about how I would interact with any child mm -hmm. or any any person. Um, and the way that I communicate 
right now with you, Callie, is I'm talking to you. I'm talking at you actually quite, <laughs> quite a lot. Um, so right. but there's there's a lot of language that we've already given in how long's this webinar been going? Um, twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. I mean that is that's a lot of words. That is a lot of words. So when you're thinking about modelling, it is all the time. Um, yeah. Fun and meaningful situations. Exactly. All the time, but not being so overwhelmed that you have to do it all the time that you then don't do it at all. Yeah, yeah, it's so hard to strike that balance, isn't it? Between, mm. um, yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, <laughs> fun and meaningful situations. So, a lot of the time you hear of people getting expensive devices, whether that is an eye gaze, whether that's an iPad, and that they're accessing the touch screen and they're playing games on them or they're watching videos on them um, and you know did you really want to spend that much money to buy Toby to play just games on it so you need to make I've just dropped my laptop on the floor so that's great okay. um, <laughs> um, you need to make situations meaningful so if you play a game you could come out of that game and then have a chat to it model some conversation there's some great resources in um, Sono Primo, which is um, some of the software on Communicator 5. Um, there's games, but then there's communication pages um, that you can then come out of. Um, and are you going to put the um, or in somewhere the grids? Oh the yeah. Primo. So um, we had a little project. <laughs> when was it? A couple of days ago. That would be a weekend, probably last time, <laughs> this time last week, um, where we have, um, some of you may or may not be familiar with Sono Primo and Sonoflex, but they are pieces of software that you can get within Communicator 5, which is a, a larger piece of software. Um, so we basically have changed all of those into a PDF. Um, which we can email out to all the attendees from tonight. So there are all these low-tech options that we're talking about um, you can have access to. If you look at the um, picture in the bottom left there, that's um, a Sono Primo grid. That's about snow. Um, and we have that out. That was my niece, actually. That was, you know, the, the one day it actually snowed in England. I think it was last year. She'd been asking for snow for a long time and playing that snowman game on the Toby. So we've been coming out of the game and modelling the language. And then we, we got to put it into action in real life. And yeah. this was when she was asking for um, a snowball fight. But yeah, if Emily puts them, the PDF up, then you can just print them out, laminate them, or stick them in a plastic wallet. Um, and then you've really got kind of one sheet that you can just take with you to a context, whether that be the farm, the zoo, um, and be, be able to kind of get modelling, but with a nice light option. Yeah, a light option. Um, where do we get up to on here? So Sorry. all the time, fun and meaningful, com no, that's fine, fun and meaningful <laughs> situations, range of word types, we've spoken about that, ahead of the user, have we spoken about that? Um, I don't think we have. So we're not just modelling um, single words, this kind of comes back to what we're saying, but it's if um, if the user's then kind of saying words like like, then you could model it back in a sentence. I like the snow, or I like you. Um, it's kind of keeping ahead of the user, a bit like um, if a neurotypical child were to shout out the word car, you'd go, oh yeah, that is a car, or I like the car, or it's a red car, and you'd you'd build up that language. Um, so we can do the same thing with our modelling, um, building up on the words that they are able to access. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I was about to say, actually. One of the nice ways about doing it that way is that actually you are using those words that you, all, you know are already in the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So when, um, if you get car and you then expand on that and say, you're right, that's a big blue car. Actually, it's not three words that you're teaching or that you're modelling, it's, it's two. So it's always making sure you're building on that that vocabulary that's always already there. Um, following the child's lead. So this is very much about non-directive style of interaction. And what I mean by that, because that's quite a <laughs> that's quite a that's term. That's a big word. That's quite a term, isn't it? Yeah, that just that just came out of me. I didn't even mean for that wow. to happen. That's um yeah, anyway. Um better than you make out. No, no. <laughs> Um, so that's about the idea that actually you are, you are, it's exactly what it says on the tin really, yeah, following what that child is doing, so, um, which again is helping to um, make sure that 
it's meaningful situations so when they're playing or when they're looking at something that is interesting to them you then build on that rather than trying to direct their attention to what it is you, you want them to do <laughs> yeah I think that's the biggest thing isn't it we always think we know what other people or what children want to look mm -hmm. at and that's not always the case um, so yeah following the child's lead providing opportunities for communication so um, I guess what I would take from that is the idea of giving space space in communication which can be challenging particularly I suppose when thinking about AAC because AAC by its very nature is slower mm -hmm. it takes a longer time to get your message across so where we might pause and wait for a, a neurotypical child to be able to say the word we've been mm -hmm. modeling for however long we need to give even more space when we're thinking about our AAC users. There's lots of conditions where um, apraxia comes into this um, which is the long and short when the messages get confused from the brain to the body and so things um, take a lot longer um, and it can make, be made worse in situations um, where somebody's made to feel anxious or under pressure so it's all about giving time um, and making them feel like they're in control and they're the boss and they don't have to do it. The other thing I would say about providing opportunities is um, kind of about providing exposure to different environments so sometimes I think um, you kind of get this AAC device and particularly if somebody's non-mobile or it's difficult to use the device in certain situations it kind of sits on one table and that's the place where the device is used which is great but you really need to be take, taking it out into the world but, but I mean that doesn't necessarily have to be the, the high tech, the heavy um, option but taking your soft tech grids out and making sure you give um, children ex exposure to activities that other children get to do so whether that is the farm or the zoo um, and taking your soft tech along with you and modeling um, so that there is then the opportunity and they've had that exposure in a real life environment so that they, they can then talk about it using that AAC. Yeah and I guess this ties into the next point limit questioning. Yes. Um, questions are very they're very pressurizing yes. um, and I've seen it tonight a couple of times when I've asked you a question mm -hmm. and you, you look at each other and you think oh my gosh what was it you were actually asking for? Just give me a minute for? to think about that. Yeah. Let me just process what that was. Exactly and we're adults who have a fully fledged language system yeah. um, and so if someone's asking you something it creates a lot of pressure and that in turn can be very problematic for some of our users who particularly have apraxia mm -hmm. um, it then it yeah it makes the apraxia worse um, and so I mean, we would say this with any child really limit those questions follow their lead be commenting on what they're doing and it creates a much more enjoyable experience and also gives much richer language so if I'm giving someone questions all the time well what's this what's this what's this I'm not actually giving any language for that child or that individual to learn um, I'm just asking them what it is <laughs> I, I also think it's just not necessary for example say you go to the zoo and you're modeling all day long on um, your soft tech the different animals that you've seen and you come you come back home maybe and then you're using your high tech or even at the zoo maybe you've taken your high tech with you there's no need to say find the giraffe find the pig what's this what's that when you could say what animals did you like at the zoo today and then when all the animals that they say are animals you saw at the zoo today you know they've understood. There's no need to test them. Um, you can have a conversation with them and you can learn a lot about what children know through that conversation. Yeah, I think, yeah, I can't really add to that. I think that was, that was good. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not sure if this video is going to work, but this is a video that Callie has very kindly agreed that we can show. So should we have a... I'm not sure if this is going to work. <laughs> not the doctors. It's not the doctors, is it? Oh, it's like the therapy one. Sentence. I stretch legs with Yana. 
Ah, stretching your legs. So, yeah, so that was you. That was me. Um, we then did go on to, which is what it says about um, the page set on the screen. We also have a printout version of that, so we can model with the soft tech version, mostly because that um, laptop is heavy and, you know, it gets kind of achy on the arm. So um, if you have a just a laminated printout and we could do kind of um, similar modeling um, and kind of giving opinions and then actually when, um, so this was my niece actually at the physio and when we then went home and were talking to her about the physio, she had so much more to say and kind of had so much more use of um, different words because she'd seen them in context. Yeah. Does that create a lot of, um, I suppose, additional things you need to think about when you're going out and about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, it's, it's one of the practical like sides of it, isn't it? Parents have to remember a whole bunch of different stuff and then this is a whole other thing to remember as well and it's and kind of the, the practical side of making sure you've got the printouts but then also if you've got a device, the practical side of where do you stand that? What if you get to the restaurant and the table's not at the right height? And how do you adjust it? And making sure it's charged. Making sure it's charged. That's always an important one. And sometimes we forget that for school. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's really important to just bring that up. That actually, it's you know, hard. it's easy for us to sit here and say you should be doing this and you should be doing yeah. this. But actually, I think the point that you made earlier was a really valid one about just thinking about where you can fit it in, yeah. um, and just allowing yourself to know that. Anything is better than exactly. doing nothing. Um, and don't give up because you're not doing everything. Yeah. So, um, establishing a yes or a no. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to let you take the lead well, on this I, one. I think, I think actually because you probably know this um, better than me, because yes and no is so... It's about knowing that individual. Yeah. Um, and I think you have more experience with that than I do. Yeah. We'll see. I'll try. Um, but you want you want to know um, someone's yes or no because actually sometimes you haven't got your high tech, but you also haven't got your soft tech, um, and you need no tech at all. Um, and you need to be able to find out. Yeah, maybe it is stuff as simple as what they want, but also their opinions. And actually, there's so much of that you can do with a yes or a no. Um, and there's so many different people have a different way um, to say yes and no and actually you don't even always need a no if you've got a very definite yes then I mean I tend to take anything else as a no or I really don't care please stop bothering me um, so, <laughs> so um, a yes might be to look into your eyes it might be a blink um, you might some people do I know this is kind of back to a bit of tech but some people do have an app which has got um, yes or no. Um, some people have um, bands on their child's wrist, a yes hand and bands and a no band, um, and they might put one in the air. Some people, their yes is to um, just hit their leg gently. It really doesn't matter what the yes is, as long as it's the yes that is natural for the user. You really want it to be um, something that isn't of increased motor demand to them, because when you're asking to someone to communicate, that's already a challenge. Um, it's not fair to put a motor demand on it as well. So um, for a, a child that um, has a praxia, say, and they've got very limited use of their body, I wouldn't be training them to put their hand in the air to say yes, when their comfortable yes is to look me in the eyes. Um, I would just establish that and acknowledge that um, and kind of, you know, if. I was to ask you something now, like, would you like a biscuit? And you look at, oh, thank you for looking at me and telling me yes. Now, now I know what you want. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, the great thing about that then is, then um, if you are modelling, like the that video actually that we didn't watch the um, end of that, but we went on to do there were words about describing, and it was um, things like, oh, is it so silly? Is it good? Um, is it funny? And you can then still model language and get descriptions um, with your yes or no. So you might have just read a book and you say, oh, is that, was that book funny? Was it scary? Um, was it 
I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> was it boring? Was it boring? I yeah. read a book today that, um, I, yeah. Anyway. I think you made that book very exciting. <laughs> um, and then you can go through, was it funny, yes or no? Oh, yes, you did. you're looking at me. Thank you for looking at me. You're telling me you thought it was funny. Was it, um, I can't remember my other words now. Was it boring? Um, and they, they look away. Oh, no, it wasn't boring. Um, was it silly? Yes. Oh, so you think it was funny and silly. Notice how I went back through all three options, even though they'd said yes for the first option, because maybe they wanted to say more than one thing. I know I want to say mm -hmm. more than one thing a lot of the time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. I <laughs> no, I think I am the same. Um, so just going through, so be conscious of the time. I know we don't want to keep people too long. So um, we've spoken about giving choices. Um, mm. and I, there is there is an important element. I think choices are important and they have their place. I'm, because... I'm also sorry, just going to throw out there and that choices are also important because um, I don't know about in other countries, but in the UK is one of the um, criteria for funding is to be able to choose between yeah. two. So, yeah. so there's, there's the two sides to but it. Sorry, the other important. No, I think choices are in. In and of themselves, they, they do have an importance. We yeah. make choices every single day about what we like and what we don't like, and that is an important thing to build into um, communication. But they are not the be-all and end-all. Um, they are certainly nowhere near um, enough, and we use our communication for so many more things than just choosing. Um, so it's important that choices are built in, Mm -hmm. but equally not thinking that choices are the only thing we need to be doing in order to facilitate communication because every day we comment on things, we request things, we um, we tell jokes, we say things sarcastically. I think what's also really important to remember is when you're giving two choices, if they don't choose one, it doesn't mean they have can't choose. It might just mean actually no thanks. I don't want I didn't either, either of those. these options. Um, yeah, like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. So um, we wanted to just put this in here: the myths about AAC, because I think um, some of these are still very prevalent. Um, certainly amongst um, throughout my training, I think I still learnt some of these, um, and I think it's important to recognise that these are myths. Um, so, first myth is that AAC is a last resort in speech and language therapy intervention. Um, and actually, that is a historical um, myth, I suppose, and it came from the idea that actually AAC should only be employed when every other therapeutic intervention had been exhausted. Um, but since then, the thinking around that has changed, and we, we recognise now that AAC um, isn't a last resort. Actually, it facilitates language development, and I think this goes hand in hand with the second myth, is that AAC hinders or stops further speech development. And I know that's often a question that people ask about um, a variety of different AACs. So, will this stop my child talking? No. And yeah, the answer is simply no. Um, AAC won't stop speech development. It's the opposite, isn't it? It's the opposite. It will, um, if anything, um, facilitate it. It will um, help it. I think it's important not to say that putting AAC in place will always um, develop speech. No. No. So it's that can be a byproduct of it in exactly. some cases, not every case, but it is important to say that it won't be the reason why speech hasn't developed. Um, myth three, uh, children must have a certain set of skills to be able to benefit from AAC. Um, this really goes back to the baby, doesn't it? Do you, do you, <laughs> how does this, I <laughs> need to elaborate on that. How does this go back to the baby? <laughs> because do you tell your baby that they, <laughs> you are your baby that you don't have, but you are, <laughs> pretend baby, that, um, you are not going to speak to them until they've done X, Y, and Z. Yeah, no, we don't. We don't have any prerequisites for children to learn. We, we just talk to them. Um, you know, a baby we talk to, even though even though they can't talk back. Exactly. So no, there are no prerequisite skills in order for children or anyone indeed to benefit from AAC. Um, and actually, I'm just reading here because I have this article up that this came from. 
and um, I think what this is saying, and this is, I'd have to read into this further, is that, um, oh no, this goes in hand with Myth 4, so speech generating AAC devices are only for children with intact cognition. So this is where I read this before, that this is again a historical um, overhang, I suppose, um, which came from um, basically funding the AAC was traditionally only for those who they thought could benefit from it most. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that AAC devices are only for those people whose cognition is intact is actually, um, it, yeah, it's just nothing more than an overhang from funding issues, um, not because AAC won't benefit those children or anybody. I keep saying children, and I think that's because that's on the slide, um, but we're talking about everybody here, really. So I think, well, also, I mean, how are we judging what cognition is? There's so many um, AAC users that years ago people would have thought they weren't cognitively able, and we're seeing now that they're perfectly able, and, you know, we have kids in mainstream school that people never thought could be who are keeping up with um, the national curriculum. Um, so actually, in, until we give someone um, an appropriate way that they can access to communicate, then how are we supposed to know about that cognition? Yeah. Um, what's that phrase? The least dangerous assumption? Yes. Um, is that if we assume or if we presume competence with yeah. our users, then that is a far less dangerous thing that we are doing than assuming that they, can't, they can't and never giving them access to any of these devices or any form of AAC. Um, myth, yeah, myth five, children have to be a certain age to be able to benefit from AAC. Um, yep, there's no evidence that suggests that children must be a certain chronological age to benefit from AAC interventions. Um, Sometimes we put babies on eye-based devices, just, you know, because why not? And again, we, yeah, there's, we talk, there's no age limit. We talk to babies. Yeah. We don't just put them in a room until they're two and say, oh, okay, you can talk to me now, so I will talk back. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that. No. Or at least. Funny not. Yeah. <clears throat> not in any legal sense, anyway. Um, That's true, yeah. Have, have some people knocking on your door. Yeah. Uh, myth six, there is a representational hierarchy of symbols from objects to oh. written words. Um, and... Yeah, so this is the idea that you have to learn things in a certain order, going from the real object to large object to small object to photograph to symbol to, symbol, to like more abstract mm. symbol to the written word. Um, and actually those photographs along the way, like um, a lot of users say are more distracting because there's... Um, a lot more detail in a photo than a symbol, so it could actually be more challenging to use a photo. Yeah, and actually what the evidence has shown is that um, iconicity, um, which basically means how much the representation looks like the thing that it's supposed to be representing, so iconicity doesn't really play a big factor. A big it is a very big word, and I'm sorry, sometimes I just throw them out there, so yes. that's why I try to explain them afterwards, so I'm not just talking uh, gobbledygook. Um, but yeah, how much the symbol itself looks like the object it represents doesn't really play a factor in the learning of the child that's using that symbol. Um, so yes, that is what I have to say it's, on that. Yeah, sorry, you just kind of don't remember anything else, but it's all about um, applied meaning. I know a lot of people kind of get a, a bee in their bonnet um, about oh, my symbols aren't exactly the same, or those symbols look better than those symbols. I'm really worried. What symbol set shall I use? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because it's all about the applied meaning. So. When, when your child looks at the word um, stop one day um, and you respond accordingly by stopping whatever you're doing, they learn that the meaning of that symbol was stop. It doesn't necessarily matter what the symbol looks like. Yeah. Okay. And then, so how and what can you do in order to facilitate um, early intervention with AAC? So obviously we have a few things at Toby Dynavox which can help along those lines. So in that bottom left hand corner you'll see that is a context page from um, Sonoflex which is yeah. a, within Communicator 5. So we've spoken about how we are going to email the attendees of tonight's webinar. Um, the, the PDF 
version of these. So you have the low tech version. Mm -hmm. So then obviously you can download the software onto um, a, a PC or you can download the trial for free. Yeah. Um, and we also have Boardmaker Online now, which we actually were in a conference the other day, weren't we? Where we were talking about how you can create those yes no boards on um, Boardmaker Online really easily. Also, the board maker works um, with, with, eye the, gaze. with the eye gaze, which is great. Like if you're um, looking for kind of um, something to get you started while maybe you're waiting for um, funding, board maker on a laptop with um, like a PCI menu or PCI Explorer even, um, a great way to get started while you're waiting for a to Toby funding and yeah, things like that. No, this exactly. is for eye diseases, obviously not. And I think, um, and then we also have Pathways, which is an app that you can download for free um, from iTunes. And Pathways is basically a companion app to um, Snapseen, which is another piece of software that we have. And um, the reason that I like Pathways is that it's filled with loads of examples which aren't just applicable to Snapseen, they're actually looking at interaction yeah. style. Um, and the types of interactions that you could set up in order to best facilitate communication development. So a lot of the things that we were talking about tonight, about limiting questions, um, following your child's lead, a lot of that advice um, is within Pathways and it includes videos that really, um, I know tonight we've done a lot of talking. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, I suppose it's a webinar, so you can't really do much about that. Yeah. But um, yeah, Pathways has videos in there where you can see in action a lot of the things that we've been talking about tonight. And even if you're not using it with Snapseen, if you're thinking <laughs> about Boardmaker or Sonoflex or Sonoprimo or any of the other like you know softwares that we have out there or low tech or whatever it is, um, a lot of that advice and, and practice will be um, will be useful. And it's free. And it's free, which is great. <laughs> we love things that are free. Um, and I suppose. One of the things to just really highlight is that a lot of these resources in the past would have been kept in schools, mm -hmm. um, with yeah. speech therapists, with whoever, and these are now all available for parents um, or anybody to download and to get going with. You don't have to wait for that permission. You can just get on and just do just it. Get on and do it. Um, but yeah, don't wait for permission. Yeah, Prom yeah. Professionals like me and Callie, we we're not the gatekeepers anymore. No. You can you can do you can do whatever you want. Amazing. Um, Get printing. Yeah. So we're almost at the end of tonight's uh, webinar. So if you do have any questions, please just put them in the the, the comments box. Um, here we just wanted to highlight some other places that you could find information. Yeah. Um, so the first one is at Toby Training Videos. We're on YouTube. So if you just type in Toby Training or Toby Dynavox, you'll find a wealth of information. On there, it can be quite overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. So I think some of the other webinars are quite useful places to start, but you can find lots of information in there. The Angelman series is a typo there. I've just noticed. Um, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> it's not in the link, so that's good. Um, so yeah, again, they've got a lot of videos on there talking yeah. much. It's about. kind of a whole range of webinars as well, kind of starting with much more basics but um, then going on to more kind of complex looking at literacy um yeah fantastic set of yeah webinars. um the webinars we've spoken about those you can find them on the tobydynavox.co.uk website um oh i didn't put oh, this, I this in oh, yeah. I <laughs> this. okay this is new this to is, me um what um jennifer and if i try and say your surname jennifer i'll say it wrong so i won't even try but um she's an amazing mum who has a little girl called um ava and she's written a blog uh, basically about the experience with aac and it's got so many different um ideas about getting started about how to model um about the kind of task that they set themselves and really like breaking it down into kind of smaller easier tasks and um things that are accomplishable but um yeah great blog i've not read that well wow. i'm you should no you just highlight i didn't even know right so now i know i'm gonna have a look at that um 
Then we also have some events that we are running um, in a week's time. Yeah, this is in the UK. Oh, we actually haven't put both of those on the slide. So we've got one in Nottingham, oh, which is on the 12th strange. and 13th of October. We're also running the same event in Edinburgh on the 6th and 7th of October. The information for that is on the Toby Dynavox UK events. Facebook page, which you um, please like it, and yeah. if you like it, you'll be kept up to date with all the things that we've got coming up in the UK. Um, but it's a two-day workshop. Um, the first day is going to be a full workshop teaching you all about many of the things that we've spoken about tonight, but getting some real handling experience using some of the AAC. Um, and the second day is to bring yourself and a potential AAC user, so somebody who either is currently using AAC or could really benefit from that, and just reminding everyone of the myth that nobody can, you know, that people can't benefit from AAC, everyone <laughs> can benefit from AAC, myself included. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's no, 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 no. Yes, symbols, they, they help me out. Um, yeah. And the gestures right now. And gestures, yeah. I'm using a lot of gestures right now, which you can't see. But yeah, anyway, dig digressing from the point. Um, yeah, bring yourself a potential AAC user and receive support from uh, the Toby Dynavox team as well as the Rept University coaches and Susan Norwell. And it's a half-day session. So you can either come to the first day if you just want um, a workshop experience. We'll be talking again and getting some hands-on experience using the things we've spoken about today or you can come to day one and day two as a package. Um, that information, as I said, is up on the Toby Dynavox UK events Facebook page. Um, probably should have put the link on here, but we can yeah. send that out in the email. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening tonight. So yeah, I am not Hector. <laughs> I'm Emily dot web at tobydynavox.com. Feel free to email me any of the questions that you might have from today if you haven't um, because we've not had any questions, really. You no, know, the word that we haven't thrown out there, which I'm really surprised, is the robust, robust using a robust language system. I was just thinking about that. Oh, I feel um, like I was, we've missed Sorry, I, I just like diverted my brain a lot in my head. I was thinking about Jan and her blog, which was making me think about her piano and her analogy, which made me think about the robust language system, Okay. which made me think that we haven't actually used them words. But... Um, Jen's analogy is basically that um, uh, using AAC um, is, is a bit like becoming a pianist. So you wouldn't just give someone two keys on the keyboard. You give them access to the whole piano. And yeah, you might focus on just playing a few keys at first. So you might just fix on a few words at first. Um, but you, um, you don't limit them to that. They do have access to the whole keyboard if they want. And at first, um, it goes it goes um, a bit wrong and it might sound a bit strange, you might not play the right notes, um, but if people kind of persevere, if they praise you, if they help you to get better, then eventually you'll become a composer yourself. You could even become Mozart. Exactly. Yeah. Um... So, yeah, so where are we? So, Sorry, I'm no, totally that's, diverted. That's fine. Um, so, yeah, that's my email. Um, we had a little note here just to mention about the RET education event that's happening in the Netherlands. Yes, in November. I have the date somewhere. One second. The 11th and 12th of November, I think. Is that right? Um, it's the day after. Um, yeah, so there is an event happening in Netherlands. In the, yeah, in the, the 11th, the 11th, and the, um, the 12th. So um, Susan's speaking at that, um, and Toby are there. So yeah, Agana, she's great. Um, so yeah, so that'll be, a, that'll be a, a great event um, for people to go along if you are based that way. Um, you can get some more information there. Uh, my Twitter account is at EmilyWebSLT. You don't have Twitter, do you? I'm so not technical enough. You don't, that's my email address, the AAC teaching, but no, no Twitter. Um, email or Facebook, that's about yeah. that's all I can handle. And then we also have the Toby UK Facebook group. We have loads of people in there sort of sharing their um, experiences, asking questions. You can come along and, yeah, just ask whatever you want. Um, and there's the tech support group as well. As well. Oh, What's that one called? Community Spot. That's good to ask your questions. Yeah, that's okay. great for technical support. Um, Toby Dynavox Community 
spot, I think. I'll have to get the name of that. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Facebook page. Oh my God, there's just so many places. Um, and then a power clinic online. It says here every two weeks. I'm, I'm just going to say that now that Hector is leaving us and I'm taking over some of these, it might take me a little bit longer to get these out. Especially um, seeing that we're in Nottingham and Edinburgh the next few Yeah, weeks. Nottingham and Edinburgh. So lots going on. So the next one will hopefully be sometime next month. Um, but please let me know if you have any particular topics that you want us to talk about. Um, and yeah, we'll be taking um, any kind of recommendations or suggestions. Yeah. And I think, unless there's nothing else in the questions box, let's just have a little look. That is everything. So, so oh, there's something else here. Oh my goodness, someone has written a really, no question, just greetings from South Africa. Hi, South Africa. Um, yeah, just a comment to reinforce what you said about the myth of AAC limiting language development. I attended a sign language course for special needs kiddies on Friday, and the coordinator just reiterated that using signs with your early intervention kiddies, regardless of levels of functioning, is such a great idea. It's our job to demystify the stigma surrounding AAC. Hey. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really <laughs> nice way to end the webinar. Thank you, Benita. I think it's Benita. So yeah, thank you all for attending and um, print out them so no primo grids. Yes, we'll have to email those out to you. And start modelling. Start modelling and um, also have a really great evening. Bye everybody. Bye.